Ready to get started? Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to continue. We're in LIDS, Lids uh, our LIDS series right now. I don't have my Skittles with me today. I'm going to do something a little bit different today, and you're going to love it or hate it. I'm not sure, but we're going to have fun. Uh, but I want to ask you to imagine with me a world or society without fences. No fences. I want you to imagine what this looks like. Just, just think about driving home today. Maybe you're in an apartment. Maybe there's a gate. Maybe there's not a gate. But I want you to, like, imagine how the world would look driving through Denton if nobody had fences. All the subdivisions were the same way, but there was no six-foot pine stained light brown fences to keep the privacy. What would that be like? Now, you, you'd have a different kind of relationship with your neighbor, wouldn't you? I'm not saying a good kind. I'm just saying a different kind. <laughs> a different kind. A, a, a different version of the relationship you have now. We had a, our old house that we lived at. We would walk in the backyard, and we, our houses were built kind of like on a elevated grade, and so, and they weren't big backyards. There was probably like 25 feet to our fence line, and we shared a fence line with the neighbor behind us, and we'd walk out on our back porch, and the backyard would go down, and then it would go up to the other side. So a six-foot fence is really like a three-and-a-half-foot fence. And so we just, it's weird, because the other neighbor would come outside, and we would just pretend like we're not standing there in our pajamas, just waking up in the morning. I don't see you, you don't see me, right? We just, it's this awkward moment. But imagine if like that was like that all the time, just no fences anywhere, and you, you just have this shared space in the backyard. Now, I'm not trying to, like, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why we would do this. Uh, that we have fences. We have it for security purposes. We have it for privacy. We have it because we like dogs, and some, we just need to have a place to put all the dogs to let them out and to run around. And if we have all the dogs and no fences, then what happens? Then the backyard is just a dog park. And sometimes that doesn't go really well. Uh, I think really the most realistic is just because we try to get the houses so close together and it makes us feel like we're farther apart when we're actually like nine inches from the neighbor. These new housing developments, have you seen how close they are? They're zero lot lines. Yeah, they're really close. but I'm not, I'm not trying to sit, make any kind of political statement or anything like that, no economic statement. I'm just, I was a sociology major, and it's fun to have sociological thought experiments. And what would it look like? Imagine with me if God decided to visit us, and he descended from heaven, and he came down, and he observed our society. Do you think that he would find it interesting that we are so fond of fences in our society? He would look upon us and say, man, they really like to be so close together. Look how close as their houses are. But then they have all these fence lines pretending that they're not close together. I wonder if that has a statement about the human condition. I wonder if that is a reflection about who we are as humans, that our nature as humanity is our, our desire to be close, but yet separated. So we're going to explore this idea today in our next lid, and I want you to help me unpack an idea. We are in the middle of this sermon series, and if you're not familiar with what we're talking about in our lid series, our lid series is kind of an illustrated concept. If you will indulge me here, the idea is that we would have a container. We represent a container, and within that container is everything that God wants to pour into our lives, and that he pours lavishly and generously. Yet often we would apply a lid to this container, and everything that the Lord would want to pour into our lives would be obstructed and resisted. And sometimes what happens is we get into this position where we don't understand how come we're not making progress, how come we're not growing, how come we're not discovering? How come we're not receiving the blessing that we feel like we ought to? A lot of times, 
It's because we have this transparent lid that covers our container, that covers our lives, and everything that God wants to pour into our lives is hindered. And so each week we're looking at these different aspects, these different lids that might cause a hindrance, an obstruction, without us even realizing that we are obstructing the things that God's trying to do in our life. And so we're going to look at this concept today of possessiveness and how possessiveness can inadvertently become a lid that inhibits what God wants to do in our life. Offenses can be a representation of that because what we can, without realizing it, we can set boundaries in our life and say, everything within this belongs to me. Everything outside of this needs to be away. And we don't even realize that our fence line is a representation of what might be going on in our hearts. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go and rip down your fences and have a communal society with all of your stranger neighbors. I'm not asking you to do that. I think your HOA may have a problem with that anyway. But I'm not saying that that's the solution. I'm just saying, what if in our heart we have done the same sort of thing and inhibited something that God wants to do in our lives, what he wants to do in us, what he wants to do for us? And so let's talk about that today. Let's look at this concept, and let's explore a passage of Scripture where we see a certain kind of possessiveness that corrupts the heart of a leader with great potential. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 18 to discover this today. If you're not familiar with 1 Samuel 18, I'll give you a little bit of understanding of what we're talking about here. This is about 950 years before Jesus. Which, when you think about that, when you think about the Bible, that 1 Samuel is like a quarter of the way through the Bible, and that's 950 years before Jesus is even born. If we go all the way back to like the, the patriarchal figures in the book of Genesis, we're talking about like another five to 700 years. And so when you really think about it, this Bible, though it, it's ancient, like it's, it's historic, we're about the same timeline removed from Jesus as the beginning of the Bible was. And that's kind of interesting. It kind of helps you understand how connected to the scriptures that we are, that we are part of this story as well. Anyway, so we're looking at 1 Samuel, and we're going to focus in today on a particular interaction regarding King Saul and David. Now, Saul is Israel's first ever king. Israel wasn't intended to have kings. God didn't design it that way. But upon their appeal, God heard their cry and gave them what they asked for and granted them a king, King Saul. And we're going to learn a a little bit about his backstory in a little bit. But we find that Saul is a bit insecure. He's a bit unsettled in his kingship. And we meet this other individual named David who by no account should ever have been considered for king. He was a a, uh, a shepherd in a long list of brothers. He was lowest on the, on the pole, lowest in the pecking order. And yet, yet we find ourselves in a conflict between the king of Israel, an ascension, ascension of power in the known world, and we have this young boy, David, who is getting all kinds of attention. But I want you to do is we're going to read this passage of Scripture, and we're going to look at this interaction, and I want you to pay attention to what possessiveness does to King Saul and what happens as a result. So read with me. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 18. It'll be up here on the screen, and you can read along with me. And we're going to start in verse 5. We're going to read all the way to verse 16. It says this, Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people of Saul's office. Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced with joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. I wonder what chord progression that is. If that's a upbeat song or if it's in a minor key, I don't know. That's to be written challenge for the worship team. Recreate it for us, all right? Verse 8, 
This made Saul very angry. What's this? He said. They credit David with ten thousands and me only thousands. Next they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand. I don't know why. We don't know why. He just happened to have a spear in his hand. And he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Saul then... Saul was then afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Finally, Saul sent him away and appointed him commander of a thousand men. And David faithfully led his troops into battle. David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. Then Saul recognized this. He became even more afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. All right, so did you see the possessiveness that took place in this interaction? Did you see the possessiveness that was displayed in, in Saul's leadership in the face of King, or not King David, the shepherd David's success? Did you see that? All right, so it's pretty ugly when we, when we have possessiveness in our heart, when we have boundaries that we're trying to protect, and we feel those things are threatened. Ugly things can often come out of us, like they did with King Saul here. What is Saul trying to preserve? What is he trying to protect here? There's a few things he's trying to preserve. The first thing we see is that he's trying to preserve his honor. He says, they credit David for his successes. What are my successes? as though his honor has been diminished because of David's success, even though David is a commander under King Saul's leadership. But King Saul is threatened that his honor is being diminished because of somebody else's successes. Now, we talked about that a few weeks ago a little bit in talking about comparison and how that is a lid in itself. And so maybe there's layers of lids happening in King Saul's life right now. But we see that he is concerned about his honor, not because— he has done anything worthy of dishonor, but because he's afraid that somebody else is getting more honor than he is. The second thing we see is that he feels that his seat as king is being threatened. He says, next they'll be making him their king. Next they'll be dethroning me and appointing somebody in my place. And then the third thing that we see that he's threatened by is that he's threatened in his own life. It says that Saul became even more afraid of David as David became more successful. So let's pause here for a minute. Can we do that? I want to share with you something very personal. It is a reflection of my life, a reflection of my identity, my greatest values, and my entire purpose. And so I hope that you will appreciate it as much as I do. Can I go retrieve it for you? Okay. Don't go anywhere. Stay there. All right, here it is. I have this jar of dirt. (laughs) I've got a jar of dirt. I've got a jar of dirt. Some of you are like, I know that, but I don't know where it's from. (laughs) Okay, so this is a jar of dirt. What do you think I'm going to do with this dirt? There's no need to be possessive here. This is a shared space. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I don't plan on dumping this at this moment. <laughs> so this actually is not my values and my dreams and my identity and purpose, but let's pretend it's a representation, that this jar contains all of those things. I just need to give you something to visualize what my purpose looks like. It looks like this. I'll rotate it for you. There you go. I want you to, to conceptualize this with, with me as, today as we are trying to understand this, a little bit of an abstract principle of what it looks like for us to possess, have possessiveness in our heart. So imagine this is a representation of all of these things. And I, I want to I ask a question here. 
Actually, a few. I want you to imagine with me why you think this particular dirt is so important to me and why it's better than all the other jars of dirt that you would buy. You don't buy dirt, jars of dirt. I don't know why you didn't catch that. So why, why, do you think, why do you think that this might be so particularly important to me? It could be sentimental. Yeah. Why would I love this dirt? Why would I like, cherish this dirt so much? It's just dirt, you know? It doesn't really do anything. It has no actual objective value. It doesn't look particularly healthy. You know dirt can be healthy. We'll talk about that. But the thing is, this jar of dirt probably isn't actually better than any other jar of dirt. What's so special about it is that it's my dirt. It's not your dirt. It is my jar of dirt, and therefore, you can't have any. You cannot possess my dirt. It, is, it belongs to me. These are my values. These are my dreams. This is my identity. There's nothing you can do to change that or influence that or oppress that because it's mine. It's important to me simply because it's not yours. It is mine. There's a proverb I discovered as a parent. For you new parents out here, a long time ago when I began to have two children, I learned that if you have two children and one toy, one child will cry for lack of having the toy. If you have two children and two toys, both children will cry for lack of having both toys. So we, this is not something that we learn. It's something that we seem to be born with, that we, we want to have things that are ours, and we want to have as much of it as possible. And we can be easily threatened when we feel like what we do have, even if it's not a lot, even if it's a little bit, it's still ours. We can feel threatened if it's, if it's being taken from us or somebody claims to have, have wanted to take it from us. But this particular dirt, why is it so important to me? Because it's mine. It brings me to the second question. How did this dirt come to me in the first place? How did these dreams and values and identity and this sense of purpose, how did it come to my possession in the first place? Where did I receive these things? Was it I who made the dirt? Did I construct it? Do I, did I imagine it? Or did I simply collect it from somewhere else? Saul says, Next they will be making David their king. Which is interesting. It's an interesting statement. You know why it's an interesting statement? Because, because nobody, none of those people made Saul their king. Nobody appointed, nobody rallied around Saul. Nobody chased him down in the tribe of Benjamin and said, that guy over there, he's the one. And they circled up around him and hoisted him up and then carried him into the capital city and said, you are now our king. That didn't happen with him. But yet that's what he fears in his mind is going to happen is David has become successful and is going to dethrone him. He thinks that these people are going to appoint David as his replacement, even though Saul has been generally successful up to this point as a king. It reveals that Saul has forgotten where he received his jar of dirt. So let me show you where he found it. Let's look at 1 Samuel Chapter 9, we're just going to read a couple excerpts. You can go back and read the whole backstory up to this point. 1 Samuel 9, we're going to read part of 20 into 21. It says, And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes, Saul. Saul replied, But I am the, I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me like this? This is Saul, who we just read in chapter 18, owns the world. He is the king. He has all the power. And this is just a few chapters before when he's being selected and appointed by the prophet to be the king of Israel. He says, why are you talking to me like this? I don't deserve this conversation. I should not be considered for this. Let's go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Flip over there for me. It says, as Saul turned and started to leave, 
God gave him a new heart, and all Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. When Saul and his servant arrived at Gibeah, they saw a group of prophets coming toward them. Then the Spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul, and he too began to prophesy. So what do we see here? is that it is not the people who said that Saul should be king. It was God himself who appointed him and anointed him for such a responsibility. And somewhere along the line from 1 Samuel chapter 10 to 1 Samuel chapter 18, Saul lost sight of that. And what God had blessed him with, something that he did not deserve, that he knew he did not have the worthiness to possess— He came into possession, he came into ownership, he came into glory and honor, and he held it tightly in his hands. And he did not want to let it go. Instead of recognizing the humility necessary to receive it in the first place that God selected him and anointed him, he forgot that, he began to take ownership, and he took credit for his position. And when that happened— Something turned in his heart. In the heart that it says here that that God gave Saul so that he could do this responsibility, so that he could come into this blessing and this anointing, was forfeited. It was given up. It was a lid that entered into his life. The king Saul had forgotten why and he forgot how. He was king. And as a result, he became jealous. He became territorial. And he formed this lid of possessiveness that it inhibited him for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, Saul lived in the shadow of fear, of doubt, and of insecurity because all he possessed, he held a tight grip on as if it was his own and not a gift from God. And so here's where I want you to look today. Okay, look at me for a second. Look at me. I want you to look at this. We have been looking at the different ways over these last few weeks that we put lids in our life and we prevent God from doing something in our life. God wants to do something in you. Hear me. He wants to do something for you. He wants to do something in you, and he wants to do something for you. And if we have these lids that we inadvertently allow to exist in our life, like possessiveness— then we inhibit his ability to do something in us like he did for King Saul, and he inhibit, we inhibit the ability for him to do something for us that he hopes for, that we may never even see or perceive. This prevents God's gifts from entering our lives. This prevents God's gift from entering your life. Perhaps God has been attempting to deliver some anointing, some purpose, some value, some meaning, something rich in your life, and has been inhibited because of possessiveness. Perhaps it's like Saul in that he's already given you something, and it has been something that you've held within your heart, and somewhere along the lines you've claimed it as your own. Your resources, your experiences, your relationships, and you've said, these are mine. I deserve the honor and the glory, as if God had nothing to do with those blessings. And so what ends up happening when we do that is that we are never able to entrust back to the Lord the things that he's put into our care. We are never able to say, God, thank you for these wonderful things. I believe that you can do something magnificent with what you've given me, and I trust them with you. Instead, we take it, And we say, this is ours, and I don't want to lose what I have. Stay away from me. Don't ask me to let go of this, because if I don't have this, then I don't have anything. This is my identity. This is my purpose. This is my life. And if you take this, Lord, and something happens, then I have nothing. And it's a terrible feeling, isn't it? But it implies something about the God that gave it in the first place. It implies that he is incapable of doing something even greater than he has already done. A a greater work than he has already started. So there are some different ways that I want to talk about with you that we might find ourselves inhibited by this lid of possessiveness. Three different expressions of this possessive nature that might inhibit us. The first is that we might experience a possessiveness over people. 
in our life. Now, the thing is about people is that the human heart craves love, connection, attachment, belonging. Fortunately, God created a world in which we could have that with him. That is the intended desire, that we would be reunited with him and reconnected with an eternal family. But in this, this world, we can sense a loneliness and sorrow and pain. And people can often become a substitution for that, or at least a, an access point for us to experience that connection. It can be in the form of a significant other. It can be a form of a child, our offspring. What can easily happen if we're not careful, careful is that people can become a replacement for Jesus. I've heard testimonies before where people can come up and they, they say, my life's been forever changed and I owe it all to Susan. As, and Susan didn't ask to be Jesus. She didn't say, I want to try to be a savior for this person. But for some reason that we in our hearts have misaligned ourselves and we have allowed a person in our life to become a savior figure. Or alternatively, we feel, this, this might be a little bit different. Maybe this is where you're coming from we feel like we are the savior figure in somebody else's life. That if I don't step in and intervene in their life, then what's going to happen? If I don't say something, if I don't do something, then what's going to happen in their life? We don't even realize that at that moment what we're doing is we are assuming the savior figure for their life. As if God is not involved, if he can't work through anybody else, any other circumstance, he can't provide a dream that would transform their heart. He can't speak to them like he speaks to you. That for some reason, God needs you. If some, for some reason, that person needs you. And that we assume the responsibility to be the Savior. And that can easily happen in our kids' lives. If I don't do this for them, if I don't show them how to do this, then they will never succeed. They will never find their way. They will never X, Y, or Z, whatever it is that we want for them. The heart is the same because that's the same heart that God has for us. That he wants something for us. And we want something for the people we love. And we feel like it's our responsibility. And so we become possessive, controlling, inadvertently manipulative in order to, for their best interest. But well, maybe it's actually a little bit for our best interest. The second thing. So the first thing is people. The second thing that we might find ourselves possessive over is our resources. Our time. Our money. The things that we purchase with those things. That's the things that we exchange. We barter in order to have as a result. These things are our source of security. This, these things, our time, our money, our resources— cause us to feel safe. They cause us to feel stable. If we lose them, then we risk losing safety and security. Yet the reason that we have them in the first place is because God provided them to us. If, you're, if you want a good test, if you want to play with this a little bit, think of it this way. The easiest way for us to find a substitute for Jesus in our life, to find a, a a sense of salvation and security outside of the cross of Jesus is looking at our bank balance and seeing how we respond to it. If you have a healthy bank balance, you probably feel a little bit more secure. If you have a not-so-healthy bank balance, then it evokes a certain kind of fret or panic or uncertainty, doesn't it? And it shows us where our faith lies. It shows us where our security is, and it shows us where our confidence is. Now, I'm not saying you should be frivolous and ignorant of how you handle your resources. You need to be a good steward of those things. But the reality is that we can allow our bank balance, we can allow our time, our resources, and, and become a substitute for what Jesus intended to be for us in the first place. So the first thing, people. Second thing, resources. The third thing that we can become possessive over is our own life, our own soul. We can live as though our life that we have is ours to live. I can do with it what I please. It's not yours. It's my life. It doesn't hurt anybody, so I can do what I want. Yet, the reality is that our life was given to us to start with. It's not something that we originated. You never decided for yourself, I think I'm going to exist. It's a, it's a logical 
in, incapability. We can't will ourselves into existence because you have to exist in order to have that will. And we are not self-existent as God is, and therefore we can't lay claim to our own life as if it's ours in the first place. It was given to us that we are gifted ourselves, if you will. And even our life, just like our resources, just like our relationships, they're meant to be stewarded. One of the greatest discoveries, hear me here, okay? One of the greatest discoveries that a person can make is when we come to the realization that we can voluntarily make the statement that my life is not my own. It's a hard statement to make and believe. That my life is not my own. Because we, it feels good to feel like we have sovereignty over our own life, that we have domain over the world we live in. We like the sense of control and order that we can bring to it, but when we say my life is not my own, what we're saying is that it is under somebody else's domain. It is somebody else's sovereignty. And that feels a little scary. It feels a little threatening. That's why we build fences to protect ourselves. Metaphorical, abstract heart fences that keep ourselves safe and keep the world from invading our, our identity, our world, our purpose, our jar of dirt. We gotta keep it protected. So if we can come to this conclusion and voluntarily profess, my life is not my own, this is what postures us to receive the anointing that God has. This is, what, this is how Saul's journey began. This is how David's journey began. And how we continue to carry that out matters in the effect of how we're able to receive the things that God wants to give to us. Here's the thing about dirt. Let's talk about dirt. I know you love talking about dirt in this church. You're a dirt church. I'm proclaiming it. Here's the thing about dirt. This is sealed up, right? So if I don't open it like this, I just leave it sealed forever. I lock in all the oxygen. There's no moisture that can get in. And eventually all the bacteria, that good, rich, nutrient bacteria that is necessary for life, eventually dies away, and we just have sediment with no life in it. And it becomes corrupted and tarnished and unusable. I mean, you can claim it. It's still my dirt. It's sealed up. It's locked away. It's protected. It's preserved. It's mine, though. And you can't have it. The thing about dirt is that when we lock it away, it, we eliminate its usefulness. It's possible, folks, to preserve something so passionately with the best of intentions that we can suck the life out of it until it's destroyed and worthless. That we can love something so much and become so possessive over it that we ruin it. That seems like a fallacy. It seems like it's backwards. How can I love something and be so devoted to something that I destroy it? But the thing is, if we, can, if we do those things and we don't do it openly, believing that God loves what, the things that we love, then we overcome the, the potential that it was intended to have and we smother it. So in Saul's case, we read here, he spent the remainder of his life trying to not lose what God gave him in the first place. He locked down and tried to preserve it. And in the end, he forfeited the blessing altogether. Consider it this way. This is, if we want to, like, summarize it into one clear idea. Possessiveness erodes what we have, and it erases what we hope for. It erodes what we have. So what you have, what God's already given to you, if you don't have open-handedness to it, if you lock it up in your in your hand, you put it, put it away so no one else can access it and that God can't have access to it, then it's eventually going to erode away. It's going to be smothered and destroyed. It's, the life will be sucked out of it. But if we can have an open-handedness to the things that God has already placed in our life, the people in our life, the people we love, the people in our relationship that he's put us in proximity to, if we can, if we can have an open-handedness with our time and our money and our resources, if we can have an open-handedness with our attitude of our own life, our own soul, then something wonderful can be produced out of it. But if we don't, we will erase the potential by putting a lid on what God wants to do in our life. There is a way, though. Let me tell you. There is a way to remove the lid. 
there's a way to remove the lid so that more gifts can be given, so that more blessing can be poured out onto your life. And all of this is not a result of anything that you can do. It's a result of something that somebody else has already done for you. And that's Jesus. Jesus yielded his own life. He yielded so you could receive his gift. He yielded on a cross. And he laid himself out to suffer, to die, to be humiliated, so that a gift could be given. He did not become possessive over what God had given him. That was the temptation. That was initially, we talked about that a few weeks ago, but instead he said, no, I have come to lay my life down, to pour my life out as an offering so that something greater could be produced, and something greater could be accomplished. And so he yielded. He handed himself over to death so that if we put our trust in him, we too would receive life that he received life, he rose again in life, and as a result, we too can receive life. What if you decided today, instead of being possessive and locking this away, what if instead you decided to yield? What does that look like for you? What would that mean for you to have an open-handedness to the things, with the things that God has given you? To believe in Jesus, to release control, to begin to open yourself up to him and to believe that he wants to do something in you and he wants to do something for you. What might he want to give to you that is being inhibited because of possessiveness? This is my way. This is my thing. This is my ideology. This is my identity. What if God wants to disrupt that and to teach you something different, something new? This is my appeal to you today, friends. An appeal that you might yield that you might lay it down, that you might surrender and say, I trust you, Jesus. I trust that what you did mattered and that it counted and that it's for me and that it's not being withheld from me and that I can receive that today and I can live a life to include every good gift and blessing that you want to present to me. To yield relationships, to yield resources, to yield your life, to put your trust in Jesus. So let me show you what happens to dirt when we take off the lid and we put it in Jesus' hands. We exchange it and it produces something. The moisture of God's blessing is infused. The nutrients return. It is transformed into something that it could not be before. And as a result, something fruitful, something beautiful is produced out of it. So it is really up to you today, friends, that you could keep your jar of dirt. You can claim your identity. You can claim your ideology. You can stand firm and say, what's mine is mine. I'm not budging on this. I'm holding this in my heart, and there's nothing you can do to come into my life and change my mind. Or you can say, I think what Jesus did for me counted for something, and then it mattered. And I believe that he's somebody I can put my trust in, and then I can allow him to care for things that are important to me. I'll tell you, folks, it's a big break for a moment where we can get to a place where we believe that Jesus cares more about us than we do? That Jesus cares more about the people in our life than we do? That Jesus cares more about my money and my time and my resource than I do? When we can get to this place where we can say that I am not the best person to take care of the things that God has given me, that is a huge breakthrough. When we can willingly, not begrudgingly, but willingly allow the things that God has given us to be placed back into his care, then it can turn into something beautiful. And in this jar of dirt, we put this jar of dirt away as a symbol of completion. And this is what our life becomes. Dirt with life. It becomes soil. 
it becomes nutritious. It becomes reproductive. There is a narrative in Scripture that the old is gone and the new has come. That the old has passed away and then new life is born again. And for those of us who are in this room, we've made a decision who have, to follow Jesus. We've experienced this. The putting away of death and the rebirth of new life in Jesus. If you're here today and you haven't experienced that, I want you to take the opportunity to receive that today. But I'm going to ask all of us, because I believe that there's probably a response of possessiveness in our heart that we all need to surrender today. And so I'm going to prompt you. I'm going to pray for you today. And as we're going to do that, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to posture yourself to respond. Now, I can't make you respond. I can't make you say the right words. It's really what God does in your heart that's genuine. I can't cause that to happen. But I'm going to prompt you today to posture you so that you can respond. And you can yield and receive everything that God has to give you. You can remove this lid of possessiveness. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to hold your hands out like this in a receiving, palms up, receiving posture. And I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm just going to give us about 30 or 40 seconds, and I'm going to allow you to pray your own prayer and response in your own heart. God, I ask for your blessing today over these people, these friends in this room today. I ask that you would confirm the work that you've already done in their life. Set their minds today on the blessings that you've given them. Set their minds on the people, on the love, on the resources, their sense of purpose and identity, their values. Help them to see clearly where those have originated, how you imagined them and imparted those things to them. And God, I ask you now at this point to give them courage within their heart to do something very difficult, to trust you, to believe you, that you are going to care. Acknowledge any fear that they might have and assure them today. Help them to receive the blessings and the anointing that you desire to give to them. Show them that you are for them and that you are with them today. Begin to pray in your heart how you need to respond today. Lord, I believe that you are doing something today within this community. That you are cultivating new soil. You are taking something that we might cherish. And you're making it into something spectacular. That you're creating new life today. Perhaps there's those in this room today who for the first time have the courage to trust in you. We know that's your Holy Spirit. That you, that you are with them in this moment. Remain with them. And thank you, Lord, for those who are taking the courage to recognize that what they have belongs to you in the first place. God, show yourself to be a good steward. Show yourself to be faithful. Show yourself worthy of the trust so that we can know the fullness of your presence, your power, and your love. And we can share in the glory of your kingdom. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Love you, folks. May the Lord bless you this week. May he cause you to be fruitful. May he cause you to be successful. And may he help you to be disciples of Jesus and make disciples of Jesus. Amen.